Prince Harry's long-awaited memoir, Spare, was published on Tuesday, touching on topics such as the death of his mother, Diana, his marriage to American actress Meghan Markle, the rift between him and his brother, Prince William, his years in the Army, and his recreational drug use. He appeared on Good Morning America for promo and was asked his opinions on the monarch today. Let's take a listen. Do you think in the 21st century they're the place for the British monarchy? I genuinely believe that there is, not the way that it is now. Do they need to modernize? And if so, in what way? I think the same process that I went through with regarding my own unconscious bias would be hugely beneficial to them. It's not racism, mm -hmm. but unconscious bias. If not confronted, if not learned and grown from, that that can then move into racism. His comments on his support of the monarchy have received major backlash online. One Twitter user wrote, doesn't matter what he says or what he exposes if he still aligns himself with and believes in the bloody imperial core that is the monarchy. Don't care who he fought so he could have a biracial wife. It simply does not matter if you believe in that racist institution. Joining us now to discuss is Democratic strategist and political commentator Amisha Cross and columnist at Newsweek and co-host of Low Society podcast, Angie Speaks. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right, Amisha, let's start with you. Uh, obviously, there has been a lot of commentary about these two because of their Netflix special and now this book that's coming out, Spare, uh, plus Meghan Markle's um, kind of very existence from the beginning of their relationship has brought on a bunch of commentary about her race, what it means about the future of the crown. Um, there was the Oprah interview where there was a conversation about <laughs> how apparently there was uh, some uh, opinions about how dark the baby was going to be. And all of this has caused the British media in particular to be very critical of and have a lot of scrutiny on the royal pair. Do you think that the criticism about Harry's remarks here are warranted or are they part and parcel of a kind of maybe period interest in, in this couple that has been in existence in the, since the very beginning? Well, I think it's part of the natural interest. Um, the, the British were going to be, the crown was going to be interested in, the firm was going to be interested in whomever uh, Harry decided that he was going to wed. But I think that there's something to be said about his choice in a black woman, a biracial black woman from the United States of America. And it going back to the race issues that the monarchy as well as the UK writ large, have had with people of diverse descent for quite some time now. The attacks that Meghan is getting are quite similar to some of the ones that we've seen um, for, from Princess Diana, but they are amplified largely because of her race. Um, and there's evidence to showcase this from the drawings that um, showed her as an ape or her child as an ape, from the conversations about the skin color, the potential skin color of the child that she was going to bear, by all of the conversations about her being straight out of Compton when she's not even from Compton, California. There's so much there there when it comes to the racism associated with it. So I do disagree with Harry in terms of making this more of a biased conversation than one of racism. He needs to call it out. Quite frankly, racism is racism. And yes, there may be some bias that led to it, but there are a lot of conversations here that I think he, quite frankly, is missing, even though he's somewhat delving in and trying to peel back the onion on issues that have been part and parcel of how he was raised, of the culture he was brought up in, and of the monarchy itself. Angie, what's your perspective on this? Um, I think what we're seeing going on is sort of a clash of values. I mean, the royal family's motto for many years has been never complain, never explain. Um, and Diana was sort of the first uh, very sort of publicly involved with the media member of the royal family. And she was sort of both beloved by the media and maligned by the media at the same time. She had this sort of very, you know, toxic relationship with the media. And it's, it seems as if Harry is sort of following in her footsteps. He He's sort of leaving behind the, the notions of duty and uh, I guess self-restraint that the royal family uh, represents and going more towards this new modern source of power, uh, which is grievance in my opinion. Um, there's accusing someone of, of victimizing you in, is in and of itself a, a power play in this day and age. And also um, there's something incredibly um, there's something incredibly difficult about being the quote unquote spare. Uh, throughout British history, the spare has had to uh, go and find his fame and fortune elsewhere. Um, the, the, the heir is who inherits everything. And it seems as if Harry is sort of using social justice lexicon, 
uh, really emotional issues about race, even emotional issues surrounding veterans, like on the Stephen Colbert show, in order to um, aggrandize himself. It's, it's uh, social justice lexicon, therapy lexicon. That's the language of power in this day and age. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of people realize that what's going on here is, is a power play. We're seeing a war between two factions of, of the elite. Angie, is there a meaningful difference between, let's say, Princess Diana going to the press and talking about her mental health issues, which were very stigmatized at the time, uh, talking about her choice to throw herself down the stairs while pregnant because she felt, um, you know, perhaps suicidal, for instance, and uh, Harry talking, you know, exposing so much about his personal life, talking about racism, using the social justice lexicon, as you put it, you know, because it does seem as though Princess Diana coming out in these ways about her mental health issues received perhaps kinder treatment in the press than the conversations about race that are happening now? Or, or is that a skewed perspective, uh, perspective on my part? Well, I think that when Diana came out, um, there was a lot of pushback initially during that period, especially after that famous BBC interview that she did. Um, there's always sort of been a suspicion and almost a, a revulsion, especially in British culture, towards oversharing emotional manipulation, that sort of thing. Um, and the idea that like, it's sort of this idea that like sharing my trauma is literally saving lives or whatever. Um, the monarchy are the elite at the end of the day. Their, their experiences are so far away from the experiences of the average person. I mean, you even get a taste of that from reading Spare, which I've kind of uh, skimmed through a little bit. <laughs> um, there's, it's, it's, I think the reason why there's a lot more backlash now is because um, we've seen this before. Um, Diana was sort of the prototype in culture for this kind of figure who uses grievance, who uses their own internal sort of turmoil as a way of getting power, as a way of getting attention. And now in this sort of new world of social media, um, there's a lot of currency to be had in accusing someone of oppressing you, or being a victim. They have an entire media empire, Netflix documentaries, children's books, all kinds of things. I, I honestly think it's just a, a modern power play. And it sort, of, um, it sort of contrasts the old school power of the aristocracy um, and, and it, that these things are, are coming into conflict. Yeah, Amisha, I, I think, you know, part of this that uh, interests me is, right, so these are very power, very elite, very wealthy people on all side, the, uh, sides of this dispute, the family itself, the people still in good standing with the family, and then Meghan and Harry, obviously, you know, I, I watched um, some of that documentary and, you know, their pandemic experience, pandemic experience, horrible for everyone, but, you know, a lot nicer for them and their very nice <laughs> mansion, their ability to go to, like, nice beaches and everything. Tyler Perry's house. <laughs> right, Tyler Perry's house. I want to go to Tyler Perry's house. That sounds awesome. Uh, which, which is it's not like I want, I, I think it would be very gross to want them to suffer, and I, I think the way they're treated in the press can be really, you know, gossipy and really obsessed and really nasty. Um, but at the end of the day, they do have this tremendous power and privilege that then some some of the, oh, how, look how horrible we, our, our lives are because of the attention. Well, but there's a lot of perks that come with the attention and you're able to use the attention to really to give yourself even more power and privilege and prestige and wealth. Um, I agree partially. I think that with power, privilege and prestige, that doesn't automatically eradicate or erode mental health issues. Um, we saw Stephen Twitch boss recently commit suicide. We've seen it with people in America like Robin Williams. We've seen it with a lot of people who also come from wealthy backgrounds. I think that there is something to be said about trauma experience. In Prince Harry's case, this is someone who watched his mom die, who knew, who acknowledged that his mom died at 12 years old. My mom passed away when I was a senior in high school. My younger brother was 12. Four months later, he committed suicide. I think that there is something to be said about the youth and what he saw and what he has consistently blamed the press for, which a lot of people do, to be quite frank, as it related to his mom's untimely death and what he saw with the press, particularly as it related to them chastising and making his wife's life a living hell for quite some time and deciding to leave ultimately because after meetings with his family and them completely ignoring the, the, the issues that she was rightfully bringing up, he made a conscious decision that my wife has already lost a child. 
She went through a miscarriage. Um, she is having these traumatic experiences. I don't want a repeat of what happened with my mom. I think a lot of his book goes to him speaking truth to power to a certain extent based on the experiences that he had already had and what he saw growing up. The issues with him and his brother, I think are, are quite frankly juxtaposed with the fact that his brother was going to ascend to be king one day. Obviously being spared comes with its own, um, with its own idiosyncrasies. But beyond that, it is this was a story and a telling of a young man who has literally seen his life not be his own, who has been forced into this uh, into this era, not only of privilege, because I think that that's one argument. But the secondary argument here is one that he didn't choose. He didn't choose to lose his mom. He didn't choose to have a family basically turn against him or a or a uh, institution turn against him because of who he chose to win. These are things that are very real. And I quite frankly respect him for the decisions that he's made and the long trek that he has ahead of him because quite frankly it's not easy and it's something that he stepped forward in that many people would not have based on the power privilege prestige and the modicum of commonality that he's had for so long being a part of this british family where many people as he had you know talked about before many women have walked away from him because they did not want to walk into the hodgepodge of the crisis that comes from being in that family and I think that he's very honest about what, what all of that is. And I'm quite frankly thankful that he's pulled back the veil because everybody has these traumatic and emotional experiences. And once you add race to it, once you add that element that nobody really wants to talk about because it gets in the weeds and it gets dirty and nobody wants to reveal that underbelly of their society, then things get a whole lot harder. And I think that we should be more thankful, quite frankly, that he is being as open and honest as he can be mm. right now and still dealing with the trauma on a daily basis. It has not gone away. Hmm. Angie, what do you think about, about all of that? Is it ultimately a good thing that uh, Harry has peeled away the, the proverbial veil? I think most people, especially during a time of war and economic, like, you know, upheaval, are not really concerned. And I think it's incredibly manipulative when people who have a tremendous amount of power and privilege attempt to use their internal world, their internal struggles, their internal trauma as a way of making it seem as if they have some kind of congruency or understanding with a public that they're largely disconnected from um, and that they don't share a lot of experiences with. And I think that language like the language around social justice, language around mental health, language around things like, uh, you know, any sort of emotional kind of cultural issue. This is now the language of power. Harry's situation does not exist in a vacuum. And in this current day and age, that is the language of power. It is the language that people use in order to leverage, mm. um, in order to leverage their their, me their media presence, in order to leverage um, their 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 persona, in order to get attention. All of these different things that translate into capital. And I don't think we can assess the Harry story and the Meghan story without taking those um, that taking that into account. Many people suffer all kinds of things <laughs> all the time. Um, and I'm quite skeptical at this notion that just because a prominent person speaks out, that they're doing it for the sole express purpose of quote unquote normalizing things or saving lives. I think these are very, very kind of naive explanations. Power. This is, we're talking about the monarchy. We're talking about power here. But, and that's Angie, what's really going on. All that being true, I mean, part of what was so interesting with the documentary is, you know, as someone who's not British, coming to realize the obligation of the royal family members, uh, the idea that the, the public pays for their lifestyle so that they owe the public this number of appearances, Harry having to walk behind his mother's casket as a young kid. I mean, there is an extent to which Harry has been obliged to perform publicly his entire life in a way that a, a regular person who suddenly starts to try to exploit grievance culture to get attention, it does feel like a little bit more of a tit for tat. I mean, given the power of the firm and given the obligations from the royal family and the life that he's had to lead, you know, what is, is, do you, is there some fairness or justification in him then saying, okay, you put me in this position to be famous, you put me out in the front and now you're attacking me, that I should be able to defend myself in some way in the public and use the fact of my celebrity as a, as a shield against the attacks that are clearly or allegedly coming from the royal family and the relationship with the British media? Well, no, because the media has its own agenda. The media aren't therapists. The media are looking for what's going to get attention and that's going to draw eyes. And I think if you really have serious internal issues, you should go and deal with them, especially if you have all the resources to do so. Um, Harry seems to have this weird 
relationship with the media where he's at once enamored with it and sort of treats it like a home while also saying that it's attacking him and it's maligning him and it's putting his family in literal danger. Like that's the sort of language that he's been using in all of these interviews that the media is literally putting him and his family in danger. Um, and, and it was the same issue with Diana. Diana all at once hated the paparazzi, hated the media, hated the attention, hated that she couldn't have a normal sort of existence. I mean, they did, at the they same did kill time, her. She was a notorious oversharer um, and somebody who sort of invited mm -hmm. and courted that when it benefited her. I mean, the paparazzi did result in Diana's death, which I think complicates things and which really informs Harry's perspective here. Look, we could talk about this for a lot longer. I appreciate both of you uh, joining us here today. Yeah, really thought provoking. Thank you both. Thank you. We'll have more rising for you right after this.